This is Duke University. Uh, the paper that I circulated uh, is uh, titles on the screen, and if I had to summarize the argument, uh, I would say that um, it takes off from the um, the proposition that performance um, has um, become central to uh, this moment that we're in, whether we want to call it neoliberal capitalism or whether. We're now searching for a different vocabulary. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, whatever you want to call it, performance um, is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a key phenomenon, a, a ubiquitous phenomenon, as I refer to it in the paper, and that, um, and that therefore performance studies has a particular kind of a role. Um, but that that role needs to be self-critical if performance studies wishes to be critical of <laughs> our neoliberal moment, um, if it wishes to think about how to, uh, to think through and resist uh, the present. Um, so what that entails for, uh, I guess, disciplinary knowledge would be that uh, we have to think about the inbuilt tendency towards mastery, right? Uh, towards, uh, maybe even towards convergence or consilience of um, the, the faculties um, in part, not only because of what's happening in the academy, but also because of what's happening in what the Thai calls the general economy um, and uh, the performativity of everything. Uh, how do we um, not uh, just legitimize that state of affairs, uh, but in fact try, if not to uh, do away with it, then at least alter it in some way? Uh, so the question is, how does a discipline or a field or a department, I like that idea that uh, departments uh, are also valid objects of analyses precisely because they combine kinds of conflicts around what actually a discipline or a field is, and uh, the kind of modest proposal um, in the paper is that we can look to ideas around uh, rewilding, which I'm taking from uh, everything about science in my project is just purloined, so maybe we can have a dialogue about how, uh, how, how, how valid that is, but rewilding projects in ecology and um, also in politics, right, in anarchist politics, and the idea of degrowth, which I'm taking from the uh, philosopher Francois Laurel. Um, either degrowth or rewilding of performance studies becomes a way of ratcheting down the relation uh, between performance studies and ubiquitous performance, uh, opening up room for different kinds of negotiations, something like what Adorno and Horkheimer called uh, self-critical reason, um, possibly uh, what I think of in relation to Ralph Ellison is an antagonistic cooperation. Um, I feel like I'm always <laughs> engaged in some kind of antagonistic uh, cooperation with uh, popular culture in particular. So. Um, the um, uh, one more thing, one more preliminary, then I'll show you my, my slides and, and sit down. Uh, the, um, one of the operative ideas in the paper is one I'm taking from my colleague Randy Martin around the emergence of the derivative as a social logic in contemporary capitalism, uh, both the financial derivative and also more broadly thinking about how um, social forms derive from other forms, right? And um, and that this, uh, the, the, uh, we can talk more through the, um, the specific structure of uh, Randy's argument, but uh, one of the insights that I take from uh, his uh, argument that the, um, the derivative is not only a, a kind of um, uh, socio-political economic dominant in our economy as we've all confronted post-2008, right, um, but also a kind of modality of intercommensurability. Um, and that this concept of, inter of the intercommensurable, uh, which, which, which comes out of his analysis of, of the financial and social logics of the derivative, becomes a way of thinking about what we just refer to now as the incommensurability of, uh, of disciplines, the incommensurability of worlds. Um, certainly given the sort of spaces of marginality that I am most invested in personally, black studies, queer studies, feminist, indigenous, uh, the global south, um, 
these are the spaces often out of which performance studies as a um, as a discipline emerges right into the academy as bringing the the sort of social movements and the aesthetic imaginaries and the political propositions of the outside into uh, the academy uh, in the process uh, there is uh, this um, uh, there is this incommensurability, right, between academic uh, knowledge formations and, uh, and and this outside. And yet, uh, what we see with this metastasis of performance is precisely the rendering intercommensurable of these forms. Um, so the thesis then would be that the kind of sociality of performance, it's very ubiquity in, in, in society, um, is a kind of principle that performance studies should be suspicious of. Right? I mean, the temptation is to embrace that and say, wonderful, everything is performance. Um, this is often something that I say, um, and I want to stop saying it, <laughs> or not because it's no longer true, but because it is true, and therefore we need to somehow find a way to sort of falsify it. What, what, I, what interested me about, um, how many people know about the, the Harlem Shake uh, craze from 2013, right? I mean, how many people don't know about it? Actually, it's the more interesting thing. So what is the logic of, um, there are many YouTubes to bring you up to see that. <laughs> okay, right? uh, the uh, a, a social form, social dance form that became popular uh, in the 1980s uh, was revived. Actually, this is an image. Uh, let me turn the music down for a second. Um, this is an image from a music video that revived it in a kind of nostalgic mode, cir circa uh, 2001. Right, so it was already um, a kind of throwback then. Right, you know, 10 years ago now. Right. And then this is a video from um, uh, just the now, ubiquitous now of, of, of YouTube today, right? Um, I don't wanna do that, I wanna go back, sorry. Um, where, uh, where we have a certain kind of uh, GIF uh, performing for the camera, right, in the bedroom. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, in the wake of the 2013 "Quote unquote revival of the Harlem Shake," which I'll say something in the next slide. You you began to find these um, basically pedagogic videos, right, showing people how to actually do the original dance form, right. So um, uh, the junkyard, and there's actually several versions of this, like kind of pedagogic sharing out, right. And um, you know the spirit of uh, of sharing the dance, right, and and, uh, and and circulating black social dance forms, right, through media, through um, uh, through, uh, through through technology, um, on the one hand, becomes a very sort of source for the kind of extraction, uh, the alienation, the appropriation, and also like the derivation of sort of new musico aesthetical uh, uh, forms, like um, the um, like this, which is the quote unquote shape, <laughs> uh, circa 2013. Uh, Look the music, so you can see that. Um, this is a um, this is a, an entirely different musical structure, right? Uh, Bowers hit from 2013. It's not the boom boom bop out of which you then perform the original Harlem Shake. It's actually more contemporary trap music, which takes a kind of build and then the break, right? It is also kind of a digital logic, uh, which you see also in these. Um, uh, in the, the digital logic that you also see in the videos that were made, in which they all have a kind of um, digital state of on or off, right? All the videos pretty much take the form of um, before and after the break, right? Before the break, people are in spaces like this, right? You know, workspaces, um, in some cases, lecture spaces like a, a college um, a dorm room, it looks like, right? You know, and then the break drops, and suddenly half of people are naked. Um, there's like helmets on, right, uh, and sort of spastic dancing. Um, uh, we could do one here now, but yeah. we'll uh, uh, So part of what made it circulate was precisely that, you know, these are supposed to be able to loop in or not, but you kind of, I'll just loop it myself physically here. Um, you see that, you know, that kind of before and after, uh, which digitizes, right? Uh, a certain kind of analog, right, for lack of a better word, mode of circulating, um, uh, uh, a black performance, right? So this has a kind of consequence in my argument. If that's ubiquitous performance, then um, I'm also thinking about virtuosity. Um, and uh, the second case in the in the in the um, 
Uh, in the paper is the uh, performance artist Ryan McNamara. Uh, I look at two pieces of his one is called Make Ryan a Dancer. And uh, these are two slides of uh, Ryan uh, on the one hand with the um, uh, actually a modern dancer who's also an exotic dancer, uh, Kira Blazik. And uh, on the right, um, the American Ballet Theater dancer David Halberg. Um, so the premise of this piece was over like a period of an exhibition. Uh, he went into the studio, which was actually within the uh, gallery space, and was taught a new dance form right, for the, over the space of three months. Right? So the artist himself became engaged in this process of public rehearsal, in which um, the piece consisted of sort of acquiring, in some degree, a kind of uh, virtuosity, right? But of course, as you can be seen on the right, right, the level of virtuosity <laughs> that he can obtain in relationship to a ballet dancer is, is, is nothing like the um, <laughs> actual virtuosity, right? And, but I think that that fascination, on the one hand, of the vulnerability of the artist who's willing to sort of produce a mode of performance which is actually amateur and in, in expert uh, and de-skilled, but nonetheless in a kind of participatory relationship to uh, a certain model of virtuosity, uh, whether it's a kind of classical high art aesthetic like the ballet or what we would consider to be a kind of degraded popular form or some of consider degraded uh, I would certainly of exotic dancing, pole dancing, right? A kind of democratic populism of virtuosity, right? Which is no longer attached to particular modes of cultural uh, hierarchy, but nonetheless is circulating within uh, popular, uh, popular culture and in contemporary art spaces. I think that the endurance of virtuosity within uh, the kind of contemporary ubiquity of performance is something to take note of uh, in relationship to what we often talk about the kind of democratization or the de skilling or the amateur, um, uh, the, the, the ubiquity of the amateur. I think the amateur actually produces a kind of dialectical nostalgia uh, for modes of virtuosity, even as those, even, even as that nostalgia gets transposed to all kinds of unlikely locations, such as uh, pole dancing, right? Um, the second example uh, that I look at um, is uh, his uh, McNamara story ballet about the internet, um, which he, having then trained himself, <laughs> quote unquote, trained himself as a dancer in a variety of, um, uh, of, of, of dance genre, uh, then made himself into a choreographer, right? You know, and again, interested in what's the relationship between um, the, the kind of virtuosic artist whose virtuosity consists precisely in being able to take on. Right, and sort of create a kind of scene or scenario or aura rather than the actual mode of expertise itself. So reinventing the ballet, um, what's interesting about this is both that it derives, the title meme is obviously a reference to these memes that I've been showing you, gifs and other images that sort of circulate uh, in fragments, literally in derivative chunks, right? So you never actually see the whole piece. Um, I'm also not describing the whole piece entirely, right? Um, these are all images purloined from the web that circulate within the web that have sort of a life within the expert spaces such as this one, but then also uh, clearly accrue value precisely because they've been valorized within these networks of, um, of, of, of entertainment uh, and uh, in this case kind of commercial art. This is, um, this is from a, 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 a performance um, biennial in New York. And Meme was also then re-performed last year in Miami as part of uh, Miami Art Basel. So, um, so I look at that, and um, and then the last um, the last artist that I look at uh, is uh, is uh, Neo Bustamante, and um, I'm interested in given uh, given the ubiquity of performance, right? Um, which proposes a certain kind of challenge to performance studies in its um, in its aim to be um, marginal, right, or critical, right? Um, what is the, you know, what is this, again, this classic question of how to, um, how to resist or subvert um, the, uh, the conditions of artistic production that are present? And uh, these are two slides from uh, Nea Bustamante, who's a performance artist. Uh, her participation in the television show, Work of Art, America's Next Great, uh, artist, <laughs> which she lost. <laughs> she was kicked off after three episodes. Um, and there's a certain kind of art failure embedded within the competitive logics of these participatory reality shows. Um, and so I'm really drawing here on the work of Jennifer Doyle, 
who uh, is here on campus today talking about soccer in another location. Uh, so if uh, that is interest to you, great, and this is what I'm doing, you can go. Uh, but I'm here, I'm drawing upon Jennifer's work on, on uh, Neo's um, intervention, uh, again around a kind of vulnerability of the artist, right? The vulnerability, the valence here is less about, um, there's something about McNamara that's actually very appealing and successful, right? You know, and each iteration of his, uh, his sort of performance of vulnerability results in even more resources and a higher profile, right? Culminating in being the kind of, um, uh, at Art Basel Miami, it was, it was sort of advertised as the, you know, as kind of the keynote performance at this like major biennial, right? Um, there is a certain kind of ubiquity in being on television as well, right? But it's also relevant that the piece that we see here on the left, in which Bustamante was asked to make a piece of shop art, right? The, the challenge was to make a piece of work that would shock the, uh, and so how do you win? Right? That kind of situation, right? I mean, and uh, well, she won by losing, <laughs> by making a piece that was actually unacceptable. Um, that sort of traverse the fantasy of network television's desire for a shocking performance artist, right? And we can talk more about that, but I think that there is, um, there's something there which I would like to explore, which gets encapsulated in this meme here, which I'll probably end on some other time, uh, where um, in response to one, um, uh, one crit, uh, Bustamante said, you know, I am not responsible for your experience of my work. Uh, and this became a meme, uh, and um, you can also buy a t-shirt now, right? So the idea is not to uh, have a kind of standpoint uh, that is outside the commercial, right? That's outside the economy, right? But actually look for, in drawing on Randy Martin's argument that we are after economy in a certain way. That the, that the, that the era of the derivative brings in a kind of collapse of the economy as we know it. Um, you know, the arts and humanities are being defunded, but everybody's being defunded, right? Everything is kind of in collapse, right? And so our relationship to it is not um, a certain kind of looking for a kind of holding on to some authentic prior or a, a kind of, here I would break with Adorno and this idea of sort of preserving the autonomy of the aesthetic as a kind of sad or melancholy refuge uh, from uh, the commercial de uh, degradation of the culture industry, but rather to try to find these sort of moments of, of, um, of uh, you know, of failure, of vulnerability, and of um, and, and a momentary rupture. I guess that's what I would, where I would, where where I would um, leave it, where where um, uh, the artist disclaims responsibility for the experience of the audience. I think that in the kind of compulsory participation and enjoyment, and even democratization of work, right? What could be more democratic in some ways than artists subjecting their, their work to the evaluation of experts on public, maybe not public, on private television, right? But actually to, to, to sort of participate enough to be there, but then to explain responsibility, right? And actually to put, to put that burden on the social, I think becomes a very interesting way of intervening uh, in, uh, in, in the social logics of the derivative. So I'm sure I'm out of time. So at that point, I'll just stop. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.